Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is a College Tracker presentation. I'm thrilled that Suji from College Tracker has invited me to talk to you about the college journey. I know that some of you may have questions after the presentation. You can type them into a box and after the presentation's over, we're gonna try to get back to everybody on the different questions you may have. Just some beef brief background. Um, my name is Lori Kopp Weingarten. I am a private college consultant. I have my, I am a certified educational planner. My educational background was I graduated many years ago from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania with my Bachelor of Science in Economics. I then worked for several years in marketing and then went back to get my MBA at Harvard Business School. I worked as a University of Pennsylvania alumna interviewer for over 20 years. And then I founded One Stop College Counseling with my partner, Elsie Koo. And then my husband, Matthew Weingarten, a few years ago, he's a retired physician. He joined our company as we were growing. 20% of counselors are associated with some of the groups. Um, some of my associations are the IECA, the Independent, Independent Educational Consultant Association, and HECA, and then of course NACHAC. I'm also a member of the College of the Character Collaborative. That is a relatively new group. It's a group of admission officers. Oops, sorry about that. It's a group of admission officers and counselors and other individuals trying to advance the identification and consideration of character character attributes in the admission process. Um, and that is mostly because colleges are looking for good, good students and good people. So that character collaborative is a wonderful group to be part of. Um, I regularly tour colleges and I meet with admission officers to make sure that I'm on the, you know, on the pulse of what is going on in colleges and what they are looking for from their students. So today I want to talk about several things. I'm going to start off with how college in Canada is different from college in the U.S. Just some broad line of um, facts of how it's a little bit different. Then I'm moving into how easy or hard is it to get into a college in the U.S., what hasn't changed, what's always been important in college admissions, and what has changed because there are changes going on rapidly, I would say almost daily. Um, can you afford college in the U.S.? And what factors should teens consider when selecting a right fit college? So let's start off by talking about Canada. What are the differences between college in the US and in Canada? So to start off, you're hearing me use the word college. In Canada, from what I understand, the word college and university are not the same. In the US, it is mostly, those words are mostly interchangeable. So let's say somebody is attending Harvard University. The student will still say, I'm going to college in Boston or I'm, I'm going up for my college orientation or I have um, an event at my college. College is used probably more often than the word university, but they mean the same thing here. Um, there's really no difference. Colleges do cost a lot more in the US than in Canada. We're gonna talk later about how to bring some of those costs down, but they, they are definitely pricier, at least the sticker price is significantly higher if you are coming to college in the US. Many U.S. colleges use a holistic approach, approach for admission, so they are not just evaluating your grades and or your test scores. Um, there's a lot more that goes into the process, and I will address that also later in the presentation, but it's called a holistic approach. And if you come to America and visit some of the colleges and attend an information session, you will hear them talk about this holistic approach. Most Canadian universities are much larger than universities in the U.S. Um, our universities can have as few as, you know, 100 students per class, which is rare, but four or 500 is not so rare per grade. And of course, it will go up to some of the larger schools. So we are, we are, we have a lot of much smaller communities in our colleges and universities. And finally, the U.S. college experience is truly quite different than what you have in Canada for the most part. Um, students often will stay on campus here for all four years living in the community where they're studying and it's really an experience, a cohesive campus experience that you get. For, it's not at all just um, going to your classes and then coming home and, and living wherever you may be living and, and doing your homework. It's, it's very 
very much a campus environment and a campus experience. So just to give you some background, all U.S. colleges have, are free to decide how many international students they will take. And it's something that um, they decide individually. So you can see there are quite different, uh, quite a few differences here. So Harvard has 13% international students right now. NYU is one of the higher ones with 21%. Um, a school like Vanderbilt has 7% and Notre Dame in Michigan, 7%. Um, Vanderbilt's 9%, I think I might have just said 7 um, So it's up to a college how many international students they would like to take. And then in terms of Canadian students, um, also varies. So Harvard has 11% Canadians on campus right now. MIT has 6%. Princeton has about 3.5%, and as does Yale. The University of Pennsylvania is at about 3%. So the number of Canadians will vary year to year. This is right now their four-year snapshot of what's on their camp, how many Canadians are on their campus. And you do not need a visa. Most countries come of most countries sending students to the US will need a visa to study here. In Canada, you do not need a visa, but you need that I-20. Okay, so moving on. Is getting admitted to college as hard as everybody says it is? Um, the media does portray a rather dismal picture sometimes, um, but it is not so hard. So what I want you to do is look at the two bottom parts of this pyramid and add them up. So 40% plus 43% is 83%. 83 83% of colleges will admit 50% or more of applicants. I'm gonna say that again. 83% of United States colleges admit 50% or more, half or more of their applicants. So it is not difficult to get into a U.S. college. The average U.S. college admission rate is 66%. So on average, colleges in the U.S. are taking 66% of their applicants. So what is the problem? Why do we keep hearing how hard it is? Well, everybody is applying to the same 50 schools. So you hear a lot about the Ivy Leagues. You hear a lot about the huge state schools, the Penn State, the UVA, um, the UC schools. Um, when everybody is applying to the same schools, it becomes very difficult to get accepted because there's not enough room for all of these applicants. There are 3,000 colleges in the United States Highly selective does not mean better education. Highly selective means exactly what it says. It's highly selective. It's a popular school. People know about it and the applications typically soar and increase typically each year. Um, but where your child attends or if you're the team where you attend is less important than the other than the fit you're looking to get out of college not just get into college you want to get out and graduate um, to having done well there so you want to make sure that you find a school that fits you in in all the different aspects a school where you'll you will thrive so let, moving on to has the process changed much in the last two decades? It has changed, but many things have stayed the same. So when we're talking about the selective college admissions, the colleges that don't admit 75% of students, um, certain things have always been important. Even when I applied decades ago, um, you needed to take rigor, uh, rigorous classes, classes, honors classes, AP classes, or IB classes if they're offered. You need to take classes that challenge you. So they would look at your grades in those classes. Also standardized test scores, SAT or ACT. Essays were important. Your teacher and your school counselor recommendations were, have always been important. Interviews if a college offers them. So many colleges in the U.S. will offer on-campus interviews or alumni interviews. If they offer them and you have an interview, that's an important consideration. Not as important as your transcript, which is the most important thing here, your grades and the rigor, but they, it will be factored in. Extracurricular activities are very important. We're probably one of the only countries that places such an importance, level, high level of importance, but they are looking to see if you come to their college, how active will you be on their, at their college? Um, they want a, to build this campus community, so they don't want students who all they do is study. So they do look for students who can handle the rigor of the college curriculum, but also will be active in, 
in, on the college campus. SAT subject tests have been around. People think they're new because the name has changed. They used to be called achievement tests. So they then changed the name to SAT twos and then to SAT subject tests. They are not a hugely important factor in admissions, but they still play a role. And then early decision, early action, rolling admissions has been around for a very long time. So these are things that have always been important. Um, many colleges in the US use what they call a, a holistic approach. So that means they're looking at everything. So of course, again, they're looking first at the rigor and the grades on your transcript and your test scores. Um, but they will look at other things. They want to get an idea of who you are as a person. Where where did you attend high school? Where are you from geographically? What talents do you have? What leadership potential do you have? What have your experiences been? What are your aspirations? What do you hope to be when you graduate college? Though so they'll also look at things like, are you a first generation college student? Has nobody in your class, in your family ever gone to college before? They'll look at Sometimes they'll look at legacy to see if there's a huge history of your family attending a college. They'll look at athletic ability for the athletes they're recruiting. They'll look at sometimes the ability to pay or to afford the college. Um, so there are many different factors that go into this holistic approach. So let's talk about what's different, what is not the same as it was back when I applied to college. Um, first of all, the rankings. US News and World Report is one very famous ranking. Um, it started to on an annual basis in 1987. They are great for a general idea of maybe of how competitive the school is, but the rankings use all different sorts of criteria to evaluate the college, some which may or may not be important to you. So when you do look at rankings, look at what criteria was used to to kind of rank the schools and make sure that that is a criteria that you agree with. But um, right now, I would say the rankings are here to stay and there are many, you know, Ford's ranks, Money Magazine ranks, Wall Street Journal ranks. There are many different ranking um, vehicles and they all come up with different ranks of the colleges. The ACT, so years ago in America, the East Coast and the West Coast took the SAT and the Midwest would take the ACT. At this point, it's not like that at all. Students should take the test that they're going to score the best on. Every college in the country will accept either test, the SAT or the ACT. Um, so you should take the test that you will do the best on. The SAT also has changed. There have been many changes throughout the year, throughout the years. Um, the latest change was March of 2016 when it went back to the score out of 1600, but they have been They've had many changes over the years. Essays, so when I was applying to college, again, we're talking in the dark ages, um, the, the admission officers would say, make sure it's completely your own work and just proof it and send it in. At this point, they're really saying that somebody else should look it over. That does not mean somebody else should write the essay. It needs to be in your voice. But um, they don't want to see grammar mistakes or missing punctuation. So at this point, somebody else should be looking at it to make sure it sounds like you, it, it reflects who you are as a person, and that um, there are not some careless mistakes. You also want to make sure that if you put the name of a school in your essay, if you are applying to Princeton, you don't then say, and that is why I'd like to go to Columbia. So you, you want another pair of eyes on that essay. Extracurriculars, they were always important, but they, I have to admit, they have been taken up a notch. Sometimes I feel like these kids are have a superpower and that is what their extracurriculars consist of. Here's an example of some of the amazing accomplishments that students have put on their applications. These are not even for the absolute most competitive colleges, but you can see just by looking at this that students are really doing some astounding things. I'll give you a moment to read it. Okay, class rank. So many years ago, most high schools in the country, in our country, in the US, did have a class rank. And that was really great for colleges because they like to know where you stand in your high school. At this point in the US, less than half the schools, less than half the schools in our high schools will rank the students because it's usually not to the benefit of a student to be ranked unless they're 
a valedictorian, then it is beneficial to know that. Um, but from what I understand in Canada, most high schools do not rank. So the colleges will look to try to get an idea of how you fared next to other students in your high school, but it's not so easy where they just get a rank. So that, that seems to be going away. The subject tests, so I did mention they used to be called achievement tests, but decades ago there were 60 to 75 schools that were requiring students submit three of these achievement tests, which are now called subject tests. At this point in the US, there are only three schools that require the SAT subject test for all applicants. Those schools are Harvey Mudd, MIT, and Caltech. There are a couple other schools that require it for some applicants. For example, Cornell University wants to see it if you were applying to their art, School of Arts and Sciences. They would like two subject tests. Um, there are no schools that require three anymore. It's always, if they require it, it's two. Um, there is one school in the country that recommends three, that is Georgetown. And then there are a bunch of schools, probably about 20, that would still like to see the subject tests and they recommend them or strongly recommend them, but they are no longer required. Um, there's always rumors that these tests might go away at some point, but for now, um, many high achieving students are taking two subject tests. Honors programs and honors colleges have kind of expanded throughout the years, particularly among the, the large state universities. So there are programs for students who have excelled in high school who when they get admitted to the college or university can be put in an honors program or an honors college where there are usually perks. They might get to register for classes first. They might get to live in a special environment for honors students. So these are popping up more and more and they are relatively prestigious for students. Okay, the Common App. So from what I understand, College Tracker will be running a webinar with Meredith Lombardi from the Common App on October 9th of this year. So to find out more of the tricks and how to use the Common App, you might want to tune into Common Tracker's webinar on that again on October 9th. But the Common App used to be not so widely used. At this point, it is very widely used. What it is, is students can um, fill out an application one time and over 800 colleges participate, not just U.S. colleges, but even some international colleges. And you can use that application to apply. You just basically get a credit card and you just click which ones you want to apply to. Um, but many of the schools now have supplemental essays on top of it. So when you finish your Common App, there are some schools where you can literally just click a button, pay your fee and apply to those schools. There are some others will say, wait, before you apply, we would like you to write an additional essay. It might be, why are you interested in this college? It might be, what makes you smile? But it will, may, may have another essay. So it's not quite as easy to use in terms of the essay part, but everything else you're not repeating all the information over and over again of your name, your address, your high school, your courses. There's another app that's relatively new called the Coalition app. Not all colleges participate in this application, but um, there are some, and that is another choice when you're applying for college, you may use that app if the college is part of a member of the coalition. Okay, early decision. So early decision I mentioned has been around a very long time, but more and more students every year are doing early decision. So just in case you're not familiar with the term, early decision means that when you are applying to a school, the student will sign a contract saying, if you accept me, I will attend. And then the parent will sign that contract. And then the school counselor will sign that same contract. If you are admitted to that school, you then need to go to that school. There is a slight exception if your financial aid is not strong. Um, strong enough for what you need but normally you need to if you apply to ed somewhere you will be going there um so you want to think about it carefully you may wonder why would i commit to a school um and there is and not only are you committing but if you get in 
you must also rescind your other applications you will not hear if you got in for, to the other schools. So the question again might be, why would I do that? So just to show you some of the statistics, I'm not going to read through all of these, but looking at Brown, this is last year's round, early decision round. In the early decision round, they did accept 18% of students. That will include the athletes, but 18% of applicants were accepted. Um, 5% were accepted in the regular round. And you could see this going down, um, skipping down to Penn, which is also highlighted. The University of Pennsylvania accepted 18% also and 5% in the regular round. Harvard was 13%. In the early action round, it is a restricted early action, so you, you don't have to go if you get in, although they have a very high percent of people going who, you know, when you're admitted to Harvard, you're often very tempted to go, 3% um, in the regular round. So there is a benefit to applying early decision and actually early action also. Early action is not, not binding. You don't have to rescind your applications. You um, just apply early and you hear early. Early decision two has been a change over the last um, many years. It, it's a second chance at early decision. So let's say you did apply early decision to Cornell and you did not get in. You now have another chance at a school that would offer an early decision two. It is still binding, but you can do Tufts or Vanderbilt or Washington University in St. Louis. And again, increase your chances of acceptance by committing to them. It's kind of like you show them the love saying, I love this school, I'm committing to you. And they will really look at your application very carefully. Waiting list. So I just want to briefly mention that normally or years ago when people were on a waiting list, they felt like, oh, I might get in if a bunch of people don't come or accept the offer of admission, I might get in. That's still the case, but many schools now are putting more students on the waiting list than they actually have room for in their entire class. So a couple years ago, Cornell put over 6,000 students on their waiting list. Their class size is around 3,500. So uh, in general, waiting lists are more like honorable mention. There will be some students taking, taken off some waiting lists, and those are those lucky few. But waiting lists in general, you don't want to you know, hang your hat on getting in. Test optional or test flexible is a very popular option right now. There, of the 3,000 colleges that I mentioned earlier, over a thousand now are test optional or flexible. What that means is you do not have to submit your SAT or ACT scores if you feel they don't reflect your, your ability and what else you've accomplished. So it is best if you're going to use this approach to have very good grades. So for example, if you are a straight A student in a rigorous schedule and you don't test that well and your SAT is not where it would where an admission officer would kind of predict it would be, you might choose the test optional route. For a long time, the kind of rumor was international students really couldn't do it because it seemed to only be for the US students where the colleges were very familiar with the curriculum. But at this point, there are many international students who many colleges who will allow international students to apply test optional, just not as many as if they were in the US. But for a list of which schools are test optional or test flexible, um, test flexible means that you might not do well in the SAT or ACT, but your subject tests or your IB exams or your AP exams might be strong, you can apply with those tests instead. So again, for a list of which colleges and universities will allow you to apply not send, without sending test scores, go to www.fairtest.org and there is a link there where you can click, which you can click on for international. Okay, demonstrated interest. So not all schools use demonstrated interest, but there is a very important factor called a college's yield and about 80% of colleges are tracking demonstrated interest. So what is demonstrated interest? It is a measure of how interested a student is in a particular college. They might, colleges might look at, did you visit the school or did you meet us when we came to your high school or did you go to a college fair and talk to us then? Um, did you sit in on a class when you visited our school? Did you take the time and effort to interview with us at our school or via Skype? So demonstrated interest is a measurement of a college kind of 
guessing how interested you are in the college. You know, are you opening their emails? Are you just kind of like your interaction with the college will revolt, result in a demonstrated interest score. Yield, which is the reason why they are so interested in demonstrated interest, it's the percent of admitted students who actually enroll in the college, and that number is reported. So colleges are paying attention to their yield. Just a fact, um, right now Harvard and Stanford have the highest yields in the country, meaning that if they accept you into their college, into Harvard or Stanford, there is a oh, an over 80% chance that you will attend. Okay, cost of attendance, that has been a big change, unfortunately. College costs have gone their way up um, in the last 30 years. Adjusted for inflation, these are the costs. 30 years ago, a public state school on average in the U.S. was $9,000. It is now $21,000, more than doubled. Again, this, these numbers are already adjusted for inflation. Same thing with a private school. It, they were $22,000 a year on average, and they're now $48,000. Again, this is not reflecting sticker price. So the sticker price of many U.S. private schools that are highly selective is now in the mid-70s, so maybe $76,000. But this is what um, the cost of attendance will, would be across the board for all schools. Yesterday, so this is a little bit of good news, yesterday Inside Higher Ed published a survey of over 350 college admission leaders and what it said was that 58% of college admission leaders right now are concerned about maintaining the current levels of international students. So just with what's going on here in America, um, colleges are definitely concerned that international students might be dropping in terms of interest in U.S. colleges. So 51% in the survey that was released yesterday reported, 51% of colleges reported that they will increase scholarships for international students to help entice them to consider college in the U.S. So that, that's actually great news for all of you Canadians and actually anybody who's international. Well, how can families afford college? I mentioned earlier that the prices are, are very high here. There are two types of aid. I am not an expert on need-based financial aid, but in general, that is based on your family income. Colleges will determine what they believe your need to be. So it, it often doesn't match up with what the family believes the need to be, because some families feel they can't afford college here at all. Colleges um, here will look at your income, they will look at your assets, some colleges will look at your assets and what they feel you've saved, and they will make a determination on how much need you meet, need, how much financial aid you need. There's also a completely different type of aid here called merit aid, which has nothing to do with how much money you might need. It's more how much the college would like to have you as a student in their college. So it gets a little complicated. And again, I'm not going to go into all the nitty gritty of um, financial aid, but I just want to talk about, I, I only took, I broke it up into a few categories here, four categories. These are not all the schools. I picked three randomly just to show you in each category how this works. So there are, in the first category on the left, there are some schools that only give need-based financial aid. So Princeton, Bucknell, Stanford University. They are three of a bunch that will give financial aid to international students, but only based on your family's situation, their financial situation. They will not give money based on how much they want you as a student in their college. It is strictly based on your financial need. There are other colleges that will only give award money based on merit for international students. So Boston University, Fordham University, Michigan State University, those are just a sample of the many colleges that say, okay, we're going to give our need-based money to our American students who have real need to come here, but we will entice some international students with merit money. So um, that's how that works. Then there are schools that will do both. They will give possibly need money, possibly merit money, and maybe both. And a sample of those would be Tulane University, Case Western University, and Emory University. They will look at your situation and possibly award both. 
And then there are schools that just do not give any money at all for international students, which means you would be paying the full sticker price. And an example would be University of Michigan, William, the College of William and Mary and University of Pittsburgh. Um, there are other schools like that where they reserve their money for United States students. So I just wanted to lay that out there. The way you can find out is you can go on a college's website and click financial aid under the, it's usually under the admission tab, and then just see what the policy is for international students. If you don't qualify for need-based aid, it might make sense to focus on colleges that will award merit aid if you are looking to not pay the full price. However, some colleges do not give merit aid to anybody, whether you're international or an American citizen, no merit aid. The Ivy League has a strict policy against merit and athletic money, and there is, they are they're fantastic if you have need based, um, if you have need, and they will give financial aid packages to those students, often without even having to pay it back, grants but no merit money. There are other schools also that even for American students, you cannot get merit aid. This is just a sampling of those schools, but there are others. Again, you can go on the website and try to find out um, just by hitting the financial aid tab and they will tell you how they work. Every college is different. However, here I get some good news. Some colleges award quite a bit of merit money, sometimes up to half tuition, full tuition. These are some of the schools that not only award quite a bit of merit money, but they will award it to international students. Again, this is a sample, so there are many more, but this is a sample of some of the schools that are generous with international students and merit money. Again, merit money is not based on your financial um, need. It is based on whether or not the school wants you and how much they want you to come to their college. Here's one more example. So I took a public school, Miami University of Ohio. They are a public university. They do award merit money to students. And I wanted to just show you that you don't need to be the the absolute best student in your high school or in your country to get merit money. So this is from one of their web pages. If you look at the highlighted part, you can see 64% of the international applicants who, are, who just started there uh, this month were offered an academic scholarship. So that that's a very high percentage. Um, and I think that's very encouraging. What's even more encouraging is if you read the next part in the red, that they were awarding merit for students with a, a 3 5 or equivalent. So I know in Canada your system is very different. So just to give you a kind of a, an idea of what we're talking about, an A is a 4.0 and a B is a 3.0. So if you have a 3 5, you are right in the middle. You're like a student who gets half A's and half B's in your classes. So and I know your system is very different, but sometimes an A is considered an 80 to 100 in Canada. So that's where they're looking at half A's, half B's, and an SAT score of a 1230 or an ACT score of a 26, which again, they're great scores, but we're not talking the very top. So merit money is available to everyone. You just need to look at the different colleges to see where you could get it. Finding the right school is incredibly important and that's where I go back to don't just pick brand name schools because looking these statistics are sobering and they have not changed in several years. 30% of college freshmen are leaving after their first year. You can see the four year graduation rates are low. 35% of public um, colleges and universities, um, I'm sorry, 35% of, sorry, said that wrong. People who attend public universities, 35% of them graduate in four years. 53% graduate from private universities in four years. Those numbers, again, are sobering because they're not high. You don't want to enroll your, yourself at a school and then leave because it's not the right fit. So how do you find the right school? You want to look at several different factors. So you want to look at location. Um, how far will you go? Do you want to be in a certain area, the East Coast, the West Coast, the Midwest, the South? Um, how far away from Canada? 
you know, your home in Canada would you consider going? The size, are you looking for a school where most of the classes are 15 to 20 students per class? Or are you looking for a school where you're in large lecture halls, you know, 500 students in a lecture, which usually then in a US school will break out later on in the week into a much smaller recitation with a usually a teaching assistant, sometimes with a professor to go over the material. But look at, you know, how big a school do you want? How small a school do you want a medium sized school with a mixture of small classes and larger classes? Academic programs. So if you're looking to major in engineering, you want to make sure that the school you're picking has engineering. Um, cost, again, very important factor. You want to make sure you can afford the school you are attending. Activities. So if you are amazing at ultimate frisbee you do probably want to find a school that offers that as even if it's just a hobby you want to look for schools that have what you're looking for um school spirit so many schools in america have a huge amount of school spirit and everybody shows up for the football or basketball games um everybody's wearing the the name of the school when they're when you're walking around campus you know you'll see the same everyone's wearing the same shirts and the, the not the same shirts but the shirts with the name on it um so is that important to you or not diversity there's so many different types of diversity um there is gender diversity would you go to an all women's school or is that not something that interests you there's ethnic diversity there's socioeconomic diversity there's geographical diversity you know what percent of students are international what percent of students are not from the state of, that the school is located in um political diversity academic diversity okay should you go to you know a school like babson college fantastic for business but everybody there will pretty much be studying business so is that important to you? Is that good? Is that a good thing or a bad thing or a neutral thing? These are things you want to think about. Housing. Um, many schools, you live on campus for all four years. Some schools don't have enough housing. After freshman year, many students move off. Is that an important consideration in when you're in, in, to consider when you're choosing a school? Greek life. So those are fraternities, sororities. Some students are really interested in going to a school where they can join one of those fraternities or sororities and other people don't. And again, it could be neutral. It doesn't matter to you. And special programs. If you have a learning difference, will they accommodate that learning difference? So other things to consider, honors colleges, if you're looking for that, do they have it? What is the study abroad policy? And many other things you could see on this slide of things you might want to consider when you're choosing a college. So there is a lot to think about when choosing to find the best fit college, the college where you will thrive and do really well, which will help you get a great job or get into a great grad school. You want to find a place where you, a place really that's perfect for you. So words to remember, every college is wonderful for someone but no college is wonderful for everyone. And I'm going to end my presentation there. I hope I was able to give you a broad overview of what college in America looks like and what admissions is looking for when they are evaluating applicants.